Uh, I'm a hacker by trade. I ended up starting a YouTube channel that turned into uh, a lot of things. You'll hear a lot of stories today, but it turned into a uh, security company, which turned into a training company, which has led to a lot of things. And um, I'm very appreciative of you all being here to watch this talk. I realize I'm closing keynotes, the faster that I go, the faster you get out of here. So I'll do my best. So it's been a long journey. I've met a lot of you, especially at the speaker dinner that we're in the far back room back there speaking. Um, that was me a few years ago. So uh, I did a, a campfire talk or a campsite talk, and I was back there. And now we're, we're here on main stage. So it's been really cool. Um, we have had a ton of fun in Deadwood. If this is your first time, uh, hopefully you're having a great time because this is probably our favorite conference. And yeah. Black Hills is, is amazing. They are, um, you know, I think we share a lot of same values. They, they give back to the community. They really care. And uh, I don't know many people better than who works at that organization. And I uh, really thank John Strand for all of this as well. Um, but we've, we've come here multiple times. We had the entire team out here last year. Uh, we had fun, perhaps a little too much fun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so last year we came out to support John Hammond and uh, thank you to both John and John, honestly, because you do so much for the community. And uh, I think there's a lot of people here because of you guys. So can we hear it for both Johns, please? Thank you. Yeah. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and just kick this talk off. OK, so we're going to be talking about, uh, about team culture. and how we can do it in this modern era, because not all of us work in the office. I bet more than half of us probably don't work in an office anymore. So how can we be a better teammate? How can we be a better manager? But also, what do we as an employee, regardless if we're a manager or an employee, what do we deserve from our employer? What do we deserve from our team? What, what should we be expecting? And are we selling ourselves short? Uh, so we're going to share insights and experiences from what we've learned as a company that has scaled very quickly. And uh, honestly, most of this has been made through mistakes. So. Um, when a company is growing, you, you learn through trial by fire, and uh, hopefully some of these things can be actionable and a takeaway for you so that you can bring this back to your team or you just know what you're worth and what you deserve. So for us as TCM Security, this is the scale of how many employees we've had. Uh, right now we're at 22. We've been doubling pretty much every year. If we double next year, that's terrifying. I don't think we will. So we've had to go through all this growth and learn. I've had to learn very quickly how to become a manager. I've got some background in it. But in reality, like, you, you only have so much experience until you're actually doing the real thing. Um, and, and so with that, we have a bunch of concepts that we've tried to uh, come forward with as a company. And a lot of these concepts are honestly built off of negative experiences I've had with other employers. And so I'm going to talk about some of my experiences, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and, and what I think, uh, you know, what I think is, is good for the people and how you can just, again, be a better teammate, person, everything. Uh, so when it comes to people, we have this concept that we, you hear us say a lot about people over profits. And this is true from a student perspective, but it's also true from like, an employee perspective. Like Our employees are more than just a dollar sign to us. They're more than a number to us. Um, we, we value them and we realize that if we can retain our employees, then we know that we don't have to reinvest in training somebody all over again. It's actually less profitable to have people leave your company. Um, to date, we have had zero turnover. I realize it's a four-year-old company, but still nobody has ever left TCM security, right? Yeah, not bad. So how do we do this? Well, uh, competitive salaries, work-life balance is very important, especially in an industry like this. Uh, good training budgets, and then sharing the wealth and driving innovation. And we'll talk about these through different stories. <laughs> so a uh, terrible photo. I tried to find a photo of me working on the help desk. Uh, and all I could find was this photo of me, shaved head. I don't know why. Um, but I, I had this, this photo because I was actually driving for Uber, too. So I'm in my little help desk uniform, and I just got off work, and I'm also going and working again. Uh, and so I was in grind mode when I first started out at Help Desk. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to learn everything. You see all the certifications that are over there. I earned those all in my, my one year tenure on the Help Desk. Um, and I just wanted to be the best me that I could be. And so during that process, I hit my one year review. And I, I, I went out and I did a bunch of research. Like, what should I be earning right now? At the time, I was earning $50,000 a year. Um, and I, I went and looked at, like, hey, what's somebody with a year of experience, these certifications? 
Uh, what am I bringing of value to the company? How can I sell this to the company? Because really it's a sales pitch when you ask for a raise. And uh, I took all that to them and I said, hey, you know, I think I'm worth $55,000. It's 10% increase, it was big, but I also did a lot. And they came back and said, we're not giving you more than a grand. And so I was disgruntled, I'll be honest. I, I went out and I just started applying for jobs. I, you know, I didn't know my worth, but I felt like it was a little more than $51,000. Uh, so I wanted to go see uh, what I could get out there, and I, I got a job as a network engineer for $80,000. So I didn't know my worth, but my worth was $25,000 more than I thought it was. And so that brings me to a point of like, hey, you need to know your worth as an employee. Like, you need to be paid well, you need to be paid what you are worth, or you should find a different employer. Glassdoor, salary.com are great, but also just networking with other people. Find people that work in the title and the role that you want to be in or that you are in be like, hey, between me and you, what are you getting paid? Um, you know, and, and try to figure out what makes sense for somebody with your credentials. Uh, for employers, pay your people, right? Uh, the cost of retraining is so much higher. If you've got to have somebody leave you and your company, you have to go train somebody else again. It takes a long time. You're spending a lot of money and in investing in them. In the end, you could have had somebody that was knowledgeable, already experienced with your, your tech, your architecture, everything else. And there's this great Forbes article I read a long time ago uh, that was, hey, employees who stay in companies longer than two years actually get paid 50% less. And we see that a lot in the InfoSec community. We see people bounce jobs every year, sometimes even every six months. And it, it's real. And that's because you can go get higher salaries. Eventually it runs out, right? But uh, you, you can go get higher salaries. So if you're watching this, hey, figure out what you're worth. Uh, and, and figure out if your employer is actually paying you what you think you're worth. Next up is work-life balance. So for me, uh, as an accountant, I had a background in accounting, and um, accounting is long days. I don't know if you know, but I worked in public accounting. Public accounting is usually 12-hour days, especially uh, during tax season. And for us, I, I was very, well, I was very money motivated, I'll be honest. I was, I, I grew up very poor. Um, I took a job when I first got out of college doing accounting for $40,000 a year. Uh, I went back, got my master's, and somebody offered me $55,000 a year, but I had to move six hours away from anybody else that I knew, and I had to live in the middle of nowhere. And I picked where I lived based on what city had a Walmart, because that's how big the towns were out there. Um, and so the closest town with the Walmart to where I worked was 45 minutes away. And so I drove every day 45 minutes to work and back, and I was going to work when it was dark out. I was coming home when it was dark out. I did not see the sun. And it was, it was one of those things where that work-life balance just was draining. I was actually not being a positive employee or a positive impact because I was so worn down that it just wasn't, wasn't valuable to anybody. It wasn't valuable to myself or my company. Uh, and I also had a micromanager from hell. Like, one day I was leaving at 4.59 and she stopped me and said, where are you going? It's not 5 o'clock. And that is a, that's a true story. So we have people like this, right? We have micromanagers. We have people that think that, hey, you need to dedicate your work in everything, your life, to work. Uh, and that's, that's not true. And so what we're finding out is, hey, there's, there's research out there. Overworked employees actually produce less. And there's a study that's out there that says, hey, managers can't actually tell if you worked 80 hours a week or if you're just faking working 80 hours a week. And at some point, production stops. Same thing with, uh, with output. There's a study back from factories in like the 18, 1900s where actually if people worked less hours, they produced more. And so this whole concept, right? Yeah, this whole concept of, of having to work these long hours and, and these long schedules doesn't make sense. Sometimes, yeah, you got a project, you got to put in the work. Okay, sure, but not every week, not every time. You're going to wear yourself out. And so for, uh, for employees, work-life balance is important. And, and so we came up with this concept, right? I, this is something that I said, oh, I hate this. I'm going to go fix this. And we said, let's, let's do this unlimited PTO package when we start our company. And unlimited PTO, yeah, it, it's, it's iffy, right? Because it can be abused by employers. And let's, let's just put that out there. It can be. Like, you can absolutely take unlimited PTO. And the benefit there is, hey, you're actually not banking any PTO at all. So we let you go, we don't have to pay you anything out. And it's at our discretion to actually give you that limited PTO. Uh, we took a very strong stance to never be like that. But what we did find was when we gave you a, an unlimited number, or our employees an unlimited number, number they actually didn't use their PTO. Um, we, they kept going, they never stopped working, and that's not what we want. We don't want our employees burnt out. Again, happy employees, good work-life balance, that leads to better production. So we changed to a PTO package of four weeks uh, plus one week of sick when you start. 
six weeks once you hit five years or if you're sea level. Um, and that's worked out much better because now we're actually seeing people take vacation, get that much needed time off everything else. So I'm not a big fan of unlimited PTO. Even if it was like perfectly not abused by employers, I just don't think it works. It doesn't really encourage you to take the time off. Having a number that will disappear if you do not take that time off is actually much more uh, beneficial and much more of a motivator. So um, we try to get our employees to, to take time off when they can. So uh, good PTO is a thing, right? Like more and more companies are offering that, we're recognizing that. Europe already has done it for a long time. Uh, flexible work hours are a thing, right? Like, we have core hours at work, but that doesn't mean that if you're, if you're getting a project done and I told you, hey, it's going to take you 40 hours, you're doing 32, that's on me. That's not on you. I'm not going to make you sit there for eight hours and do nothing. Uh, same concept. If you are doing a, a job and it doesn't require to, you to be there during the day, you say, hey, Heath, can I work tonight instead of working today? Absolutely. Like, and having that flexibility and being able to not have to worry about putting in PTO. Like, we've seen employees. We've got one employee who, when she first started, she would put like 30 minutes in or an hour. She's like, I got a doctor's appointment. That doesn't matter. Like, you don't need to put PTO in for that. Um, and, and so making, getting away from that micromanaging and that, that time management uh, and, and to improve the ability for, for employees to have, the, again, that flexible work-life balance. So for employers, these packages are out there. If you're not doing this, uh, if you're not improving your packages, you need to keep up or you're going to lose your talent. All right, so let's talk about sharing the wealth. And this actually is how TCM Security was founded. I worked for a pen test company. I was doing YouTube, not very big on YouTube, but big enough that people knew where I worked. Companies started coming to where I worked and said, hey, we saw you because of Heath. We want Heath to work on our engagement. And um, they were selling deals based on my name. I saw zero dollars. And, and so <laughs> it's amazing. It, it goes back to the same thing with the, the help desk story, right? $4,000, I wouldn't even look for a job. Like I would have thought, hey, I'm getting what I'm worth. I'm good. Uh, same concept here. Give me 10%. If I got 10%, if I would have got something out of it, incentivize me for bringing you company or bringing you clients, I would have stayed. Uh, it wouldn't even been a thought that crossed my mind. But that's when the light bulb went off and said, hey, if they're making money off of me, I can make money off of me too. And so we, we found a TCM security. And uh, that comes down to the whole concept of, hey, for an employer, 90% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Like, I will drive you business if you give me the opportunity to make some money off of it. But if I, why would I work harder and extra to give you more money if you're not going to incentivize me for that? Uh, and, and so this brings up another concept of rewarding innovation. So in the crowd, we've got Zach Hill. He's around here somewhere. IT career questions. Yeah, yeah, great guy. So when he interviewed with me, he said, I've got this really good idea, man. And I want to I put it together. And this idea is that I want to start this program. It's, it's now called the PCRP, where we don't rake the students over the coals when it comes to pricing. Like we, we have some almost like a boot camp style that we can do mock interviews, we can do all these cool things with them, coach them, get them to the place they need to be, and then get them a job. And where we're going to make the money is we're going to charge the employers to actually hire these people. So they get incentivized to hire our people, but they know our people have already been through the training, they know our people are qualified, they've been interviewed, all this stuff. So we launched this program, we had a really good powwow, got it all together, was a hit, immediately a hit. And I didn't come up with that idea. That's, not, that's money we're getting made from the company because Zach had that idea. So what did we do? We gave Zach 10% of the revenues. And, and so with that, and I'm, I'm going to share this story. It hasn't been public, but I think Zach's OK with it. Zach, the guy that he is, took half of his 10% and gave it to his team. So I mean, he's just a good guy. And these are the good employees that we have, right? We're all a team. Yeah. At the end of the day, sharing wealth is going, to, is going to lead to innovation, and it's going to lead to these things. And uh, the team that worked hard to put it together behind the scenes, yeah, it's Zach's idea, but Zach also knew that, hey, I didn't do this alone. And, and so other people should be rewarded too. And, and so like, this is the, the mentality that we have and the culture that we have, and I love it. Uh, but we have things that don't work either. So this year I said, I'm going to incentivize employees with a referral package, right? If you're the top referrer, you hit a certain threshold. It's not a very big threshold, but if you hit a certain threshold, we will pay you a $10,000 bonus for that quarter if you referred that in revenue. Um, and so the first person that, you know, the highest person that referred that quarter would get it. And so that's like, hey, $40,000 on the table for somebody that can actually come out here and, and refer business to us on top of the 10% that we're going to pay you. And so we, we bake that 10%, by the way, into our contracts. Every contract for an employee that signs with us or signs, you know, signs the offer letter, it's already on there, 10% of anything that you bring in. And, and so 
I thought this was going to work, but it came, uh, you know, it came Q3. I said, hey, nobody's, nobody's referred really a lot here. What's going on? And so I got some feedback, and they're like, well, we don't know how to sell this stuff. We're not, we're not salespeople. And, and so you can have all the incentives in the world, but if your employees don't actually know how to, to utilize it and how they can uh, you know, earn those, those benefits, it's not going to do them any good. So we're working hard on that to figure out, hey, how can we teach our employees about the products? Not everybody's a pen tester, right? So it's hard to sell pen tests. It's hard to sell some of the stuff that we do. Um, if you don't know what we do, if you're in a different silo, it's not going to make any sense for you to do it. So um, educating our employees on, on some of our other services and where our other silos are and understanding what everybody else does is very important. And that's something that we can work on as a company and something that I, I think we're going to improve on next year. So for employees, if you're providing new revenue, you should expect to be rewarded. I think that's an expectation in, in today's time, right? Uh, if you're not rewarding again for an employer, you are slowing your innovation. And again, 90% of something is better than 100% nothing. All right, concept number two. Everybody is different. Um, you saw that we have scaled significantly, right? We're, we're doubling every year. and. When I came in this, uh, I, my management style initially is very hands-off. And that is that I don't want to be micromanaged. I've been micromanaged. Hey, it's 459, right? Uh, I, I don't want to do that to anybody. The problem is some people do want to be micromanaged. Like, it actually helps them to, to have that management style. And so when I went into this initially, I was like, well, I'm just going to give everybody you know, free reign. I'm going to tell you the high level of what you need to do, and then you're going to go execute. Well, some people need specific directions, like not just high level, here are the things I need you to do this week. And that's OK. Everybody's different. It doesn't matter. But you need to be able to recognize and cater to those styles and those management styles. And sometimes, if you are a manager of several people, you're going to have seven, several different personalities and management style requirements on your team, and it can be difficult. And so we came up with this idea of trying to understand our team a little bit better. And we asked them these questions exactly. And I said, where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in five years? And I was actually in the car with our employee last night, Ange, and I asked her this question again. I wanted an update. Where do you want to be in a year? What can I do for you? And so we have a lot of one-on-ones with employees where it's like, hey, how can you be better? But this is how can we be better? What can we do for you to make you better? And, and so I want to know, if it's not in the position that you're in, if it's not even in the silo that you're in within our company, how can I get you there? If it's a role that's not in our company, how can I write a recommendation letter and get you training to get you somewhere where you need to be? And so I want the best for my employees because, again, people over profits, right? You want to make sure that your people are taken care of. So if any of my employees ever came to me, I'd be the first to write them a recommendation letter. And also, hey, what motivates you? Some people, hey, they, they want to make money. They, I want to drive a Lamborghini, right? And uh, some people, they just want to be comfortable. They want to be happy. They, they just want to have a family, have a house, be comfortable. OK, well, that's different styles, right? The person who's innovative, or the person that wants a Lamborghini, you probably need to be innovative. You probably need to be driving that, that revenue to get your 10%. How can we do that? What ideas do you have? What can we put in motion? Let's brainstorm a little bit better. Um, you know, and, and for other people, if, if motivation is not money, OK, well, how can we motivate you? What can we do to keep you happy and keep you here? Same question, and similar along the lines. What's your work love language? Uh, some people love praise. Praise is great, right? Like, hey, you're doing a good job, and, and we don't hear it enough at work. And some people like, like gifts, right? Um, acts of service, those types of things. We have that at work, too. Like a, a $5 Starbucks card for doing a good thing goes a long way. Or like, hey, just publicly in, in, in your ch team chat or whatever it is, just saying, hey, this person did a great job this week. And we should really actually acknowledge that from everybody in the company. And, and so you got to learn what everybody's love language is. Uh, and, and again, what's your preferred management style, right? Do you want to be micromanaged? Do you want hands off? What can we do for you? And then what can I do to make your experience better here? How am I not succeeding, and how can I succeed for you? Is there any improvements? What can I do better? Uh, we focus a lot on the one-on-one -on -one for the individual, but never a lot on the one-on-one -on -one for the company. And we, we should be doing that. And last thing is, like, culture is important. You want like-minded people. We find a lot of our people from our community. Like, we're big on community. So a lot of people that we have found have been people that are going out there and uh, they're contributing, like Zach Hill had, had a YouTube channel, right? Uh, Ange was just always in our Discord and just always helping people out, but she wasn't even paying to do that. She was just giving back. She was being a good human being. You'll see that a lot of our employees are just good human beings, and that's what we want. But we don't want people that are all the same people. We want like-minded. Yes, culture is important, but we don't want yes people. I want people to challenge me. I want people to say, that's a bad idea. Um, I want people to, to be able to speak their own opinion and not be afraid of speaking their opinion. And so for employees, you should find a team that fits your values and your culture. Easier said than done. Um, but you should be interviewing your future employers. We do a lot of interviews. 
I would tell you maybe more times than not when we say, you have any questions for us? No. You should be asking questions. What's, uh, what's, what's the job like? What's, you know, what's the team culture like? What happened to the last person that was in this position? Uh, you know, there, is there good training? What, what's the work-life balance? You should be asking all these questions. Interview your future employer. You may find some red flags in there, right? And uh, for employers, hey, a bad apple can destroy your team's entire culture. Uh, we'll name names. We have somebody on our staff that came from a company like this, and one person drove everybody away. Everybody. And, and so <laughs> and it was a great, you know, a great organization. So you, you can have one bad hire ruin everything. So you've got to be careful. Culture is very, very important. You want like-minded people. You don't want a room full of yes people. Uh, and you, you should build culture questions in, into your interview process, right? Like, uh, what's important to you? For us, it's community. How do you give back? What do you do? What do you, like, what are some of the, the cool things that you're doing? Is it, is it uh, volunteering at a conference? Is it writing a blog? Is it just helping out in the community? Is it just being an overall good, happy person? We want to know about that, and we, we do build that into our interview process. All right, so concept number three is complete transparency. So the mythical bonus. How many of us have had a mythical bonus presented to us? Yeah, that's right, right? So you're told, hey, you got to just meet these metrics. You, you get this utilization rate, and at the end of the year, we're going to give you something great. Uh, yeah, so I had a company that I worked for that did that, and I met all my metrics. I, I did everything. Our team was super profitable, and we got a nice check of $0 at the end of the year. So the old bait and switch. And we don't want that in our company. Um, so we have open books. We opened our books to everybody every single week. I post the financials. Why? Because you have no surprises then. You know exactly where we're at in the company. You know what our profit is. You know what our expenses are, revenues, everything. You know how well every silo is doing. And you also know how you're contributing to other silos. And remember, we talked about this, like, hey, we're not doing great at teaching other people about the silos. This is one of those things that we try to implement to do that. Like, how do we teach people about the other, other organizations and show them how, like, yeah, you have your silo, but you're actually a, a very important cog in a system, and like what you do actually helps out in this other area as well. And so we've opened up some ideas there, and uh, we, we post our financials every single week. Everybody knows where we're at. There is no hidden surprises, no end of the year. You're not getting your bonus. Like, you know well ahead of time. And if we're close on, on numbers, hey, maybe we need to push a little bit harder just to get there. Um, but we, we have different goals and everything, and we're completely transparent about that. With that in mind, <laughs> as an employee, you can't expect that kind of transparency. I realize that. Um, but you shouldn't also be in the dark, right? We should get some, some updates, something that says, yeah, we're on track. No, we're not on track. And uh, as an employer, if you pull that bait and switch, <laughs> yeah, you're going to get people to leave, right? I have left over a bait and switch before. Uh, if you keep providing people with false hope, they are going to go to a company that won't. Uh, so be as transparent as possible with your employees. Don't dangle the string in front of them and just say, hey, you know, you might get this. So let's wrap this up here. We're going to talk about how you can be a better you overall in, in different situations. So collaboration, you're going to hear our, or see our tech stack here through some of these, so please don't hack us. Um, but here we've, we've got some collaboration that we've implemented in our, our team because we want to make sure that we're able to communicate with each other effectively, especially as we scale as a company. And so we use Slack. Uh, we use ClickUp. It's really, really great. And this is just an example of something we're doing this month. Like, we're posting blogs for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And we have those assigned. Everybody has their, like, assigned blog. And then I can come in there and say, yeah, I'm done with this. Like, hey, I, I'm, I'm good. We're good. So it doesn't have to be communicated across, like, five different channels to get to that point. Somebody doesn't have to follow up with me. They can say, oh, I'm going to go check ClickUp. And is it done? Yes. OK, cool. And so this collaboration is very important when we are not in an office together, right? It used to be easy to walk down the hall and say, hey, did you get this project done? Now we are on different schedules. We're working remote. People are in different time zones. It's a little bit different. So having some good collaboration tools adds a lot of value to your company. And these are kind of obvious, but like effective communication, uh, especially in over-communicating, honestly, right? Like if you're, if you're working remote, over-communicating. Like for me, um, being able to say, hey, what is the status update on something? And this is something that we're working on as a company now, but I am a big person on the shared calendars, and my team will tell you that, that if, if a pen test is not on the shared calendar and I can't see it, then it's not booked. And so it could be in another, another area. It could be a closed deal. It could be scheduled via email. I want to look as a manager at one spot and say, yes, this is done or this isn't done. So that is kind of where I go to to see these things. That's an easy way to communicate, right? It's on the schedule. We're good to go. 
Um, and so being able to over communicate with your teams, make them know, hey, I'm going to be out of the office. How many times is like somebody just went out of the office? You didn't know. We have a shared calendar for when people are out of the office. So we know um, what to expect when these things happen. And of course, document. You never know when you're going to get hit by a bus, right? So like having documentation for somebody else to come in and be able to pick up where you left off. If you get sick, you take vacation, anything that it might be, you want to make sure you document that. For you, you need to also establish a routine and be self-motivated. So you should be consistent when you're online. Like you don't want to just be showing up at 5 p.m. one day, 8 a.m. the next day, and uh, not being around for your team. So it helps with work-life balance as well to be on a routine. Uh, it's very important to be self-motivated. So if you have a calendar for yourself or tasks, like I use ClickUp just for myself where I can go in there and set tasks that are private to me. And I'll say, hey, here's things I need to do. It's like a checklist. I make sure I do those because otherwise I'm very busy. I may forget about it. Uh, this is where I love my team. So being a better you in the workplace, like you need to recognize that people are working remotely. Mental health is a, a thing that it's not as easy to see when somebody's on the other side of the computer, right? So you should be checking in with your colleagues. Even if you think they're doing okay, check in with them. Uh, and you should be empathetic as well. You should be supporting and encouraging your teammates. And these are both messages to me from, from people on the team. So hey, this one says, I saw your message in general. It sounds like you've been struggling a bit. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. If you need my help or simply want to vent, I'm here for you. You're doing an amazing job for what it's worth. That's a good teammate. That's what you should be, a good teammate, right? And then, hey, I'm drowning with work. If you need any help writing up the report, let me know. I've already done the external. I've written it. Let me take something off your plate because I've got time. So this is the kind of team that you want to have around you. This is the kind of teammate that you want to be. No person left behind. Feedback and recognition. And again, is probably our number one star when it comes to giving feedback and recognition. These are just posts that are, are here in our general chat. This is for everybody to see. And these are just people doing this without being encouraged to or doing anything else. That's just the people that they are. And they're, they're saying, hey, I want to shout this person out because they did something valuable to the company. They solved the problem. They helped out. And that's good, right? That's, like, that's exciting. That's something that we should be doing. We should be celebrating our teammates' wins, not just our own victories. Uh, we want to make sure that we're encouraging others because you don't know, again, if somebody's having a bad day or a bad week, that little sentence, that little statement could change everything for them. Positive vibes. That's all you need. And again, a uh, better example, right? So, hey, this is great because it's going to be direct communication with her team. This is a private chat that I stole. Sorry, Ange. Uh, direct communication. She also is a master documenter. I love that about her. Uh, and she offers praise, right? She said, hey, like a lot's happened the past week. It's been very challenging. I realized that. I, in fact, documented some stuff to make your lives easier moving forward so these challenges don't come up again. And also, you've done a great job. Like, I, I just want you to know that you're doing fantastic. This is from the past week. We just hired two, two new people on our support team, and they're crushing it. And so um, this is just a great example of like, hey, I can tell you that it's been hard. I realized that. I made something to make this a little bit easier. And also, you're doing a kick-ass job. And Ange is the, probably the best in the company at doing that. All right, let's talk about being a better you in the community. First of all, cybersecurity is a small world. If you are a jerk, <laughs> it will come back and, and haunt you. Um, it's just one of those things that if you're being a good person, uh, that goes a long way as well. Uh, just, just get back what you take. Like, I see a lot of people ask a lot of questions but never answer any, right? Uh, there, there's people that just, just take, 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 and they never give, and eventually people catch on to that as well. And what I tell people is someone is always, someone always wants to be where you're at right now. So you're like, oh, I just started studying. I, I'm just getting into this. Well, there's somebody that hasn't started studying that you can maybe give some advice to. Uh, maybe you're just the, you know, one certification in or one training course in or something. It doesn't mean you don't know anything. So don't, don't have that imposter syndrome. It's very hard. A lot of us deal with it, right? Um, but there's always somebody that wants to be where you're at right now. And overall, just be a good person. If you, <laughs> I call it, it's just good karma, right? Like if you're out there and you're contributing to your community, people are watching, people are always watching. Again, we hire most of our people from the community because we're watching. And we want people that are positive impact, positive value to our community. Um, and, and so if you're doing that, like that's a form of networking also. You want a job, go out there and help people. You never know who you're actually helping. So. Um, keep that in mind. How do we be a better you in general? First of all, self-care is very important. Uh, I'm a victim of this. I, being in a company where you're working a lot of hours, you're trying to take a lot on at once. Uh, if you've seen me before, I've put on a lot of weight. I've lost a lot of weight again. And, and so like, 
being able to take time for yourself and make sure that you're being healthy and being the best you that you could possibly be. That could be exercising, that could be taking breaks, like, hey, even if it's a 15-minute walk or it's, hey, I need a day off. I just need, I need to get away from this. Again, work-life balance is so important and self-care is so important. Please take care of yourselves. Professional development. Cybersecurity is a field that you have to continue improving. And that's why we, all of us have burnout, right? We all experience burnout at some point or another in this career. Because there's so much to learn, there's never enough time to learn it. And we want to learn. A lot of us are just like, we love it, right? We, we want to go out there and we want to learn as much as we can, but we, we just keep getting, getting burnt out on it. So make sure you know within where your wall is at and when you need to step away and what that looks like. Sometimes you can hit a wall just within a day. I need to get out of here. I need to step away from the computer. Or, hey, I've hit a wall. I've been working really hard on this project. I'm going to take a week off. And, and you got to make sure that you're, you're focusing on yourself. And again, you have an employer that cares about you, your mental health, your work-life balance, all of that. And uh, complacency can be a cybersecurity career killer. If you are not studying, you're not keeping up, it's going to be difficult. So make sure that you are investing in yourself, that you find an employer that can invest in you and has a good training budget and, and sees you as a person and not profit. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>